everyone. So excited if you're here joining us live today. My name is Fatima Busray. I'm the Director of Innovation for Innovate Health Yale based at the school at the Yale School of Public Health. I am really excited to be here today live with Phyllis Mugadza, who is a current MPH student at Yale School of Public Health and um, a social entrepreneur. So we're gonna be chatting today about Phyllis's social innovations, her journey, and uh, sharing some exciting updates about the social innovation space at, uh, at Yale. So I am so excited to be here with Phyllis. Uh, Phyllis, thanks for joining. And I'd love to kick it off um, with a question just asking, you know, how did you get started in social entrepreneurship? Uh, what sparked that initial uh, feeling for impact? And uh, just share your story a little bit. Sure, thank you so much for having me here, Fatima. And thank you to everyone who's, who's watching this interview right now. Um, so I was born and raised in Harare, Zimbabwe. Um, I'm a current senior at Yale. I'm in the BS MPH program. So I'm doing my BS in mechanical engineering and I'm also pursuing my MPH in, in healthcare management. And so having grown up in Zimbabwe, my problem solving skills were always at work. Um, and it's constantly inspiring to see you know, the innovations that um, were being made in my country. Um, yes, born of necessity, but ultimately being invented to improve the quality of lives of, of people around them. Um, and so I have just always enjoyed that approach. Um, it's, it's really easy to, to know how to solve a problem if you know there's a problem in the first place. And I bring this all up because my entrepreneurial venture currently is on a reusable menstrual product. And where I come from, menstruation is still very much a stigmatized topic. It is a taboo subject. Um, you don't really speak about it. And so a lot of the times, you know, you're suffering in silence. Um, and it's, you know, when a problem is really spoken about, when, you know, you really see that drive for innovation and innovative products. Um, and so I grew up, you know, experiencing quite a few contexts. I have been able, I was exposed to low resource settings at times, um, and I was exposed to menstrual poverty, which you know is lack of access to hygienic menstrual products, as well as hygienic facilities. Uh, it's also a lack of access to menstrual education. And you know, with education, if there is a lack of that, that really does fuel the stigmas and taboos that are surrounding menstruation. Um, if you're to think of contraception um, as an example, now, we've really seen a great drive in contraception because reproductive health is becoming more readily available. Um, sex ed is becoming more common, um, but menstruation is, is, is still slightly stigmatized. Um, if I have family on this call right now, I'm sure they're shaking in the seats that I'm speaking about um, period so publicly. Because <laughs> that, that's, really, that's really where all of this started. And seeing my friends experience, you know, they had to miss school at times because um, they were on their periods where there was due to menstrual pain. Um, menstrual pains are the leading cause of recurrent school and work absenteeism among the menstruating population. And so just being exposed to all these problems, I really wanted to dedicate um, a lot of my time to finding a solution to this. I feel like it can be better. Menstrual products can significantly be improved. The first menstrual pad was introduced to the market in 1888. And it is 2021 and we're still talking about disposable products. Um, tampons came onto the market in about 1937. Um, so there hasn't really been that drive to really innovate outside of these products that we're, we're so used to, even though we have a lot more knowledge about how you know, our anatomies work. And so I really wanted to be, to be a part of that change. And so I decided to commit to studying mechanical engineering at Yale. And in my first year, um, I attended a conference at the Yale School of Management known as PeriodCon. Um, you can imagine this is a really exciting conference for someone like myself. It's like the Comic Con of periods. And so you're surrounded by everyone who is as obsessed with this topic as you are. Um, but one moment that I'd like to highlight from that experience was um, there was a display table that had that was highlighting all the products and innovations that have um, that are currently on the market. And there were sanitary pads, 
disposable and reusable options that we're used to, um, tampons and applicators. Um, and you know, the innovation has sort of looked like, okay, we have a sanitary pad, we're going to make a reusable version or a, a version out of cloth. Um, same, similar things with tampon, we're gonna make a more absorbent tampon. Um, but the innovation was always around those basic products. And so I was just browsing through um, these, these innovations. Um, and it's really evident to tell that most of these were invented initially by people who don't actually experience menstruation. Um, and, and that was the first time I ever saw a menstrual cup or a menstrual disc for the first time. Um, it was striking to me for two reasons. And the first was because they hadn't reached my part of the world yet. So there was, I really had that question of distribution and um, why certain people have access to these products and why certain people um, do. And, you know, the, the evidence of menstrual cups are, are, are very apparent. They last, you can wear them for up to two years. You can use the same product for that long. Um, for those who aren't familiar with reusable menstrual cups and menstrual discs, they work to collect fluid rather than to absorb fluid. So you could see they're a lot more environmentally friendly option. Um, and really you just have to clean them out and you can reinsert it um, during menstruation. And so I dedicated the rest of this conference to finding out why people aren't using these products in the first place. And just going through the entire conference, I realized that a lot of these challenges can easily be solved with engineering design. And so I dedicated my entire educational journey to trying to find the solution um, to this challenge. And that's brought me to where I am today. Um, four years later, having been trained in engineering, um, I, 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 I have a strong feeling that, that we're there. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that journey, Phyllis. Uh, it's so exciting to hear about how far you've come in four years, like from initially going to this conference and getting and uh, getting sparked by these different ideas and options and then creating your own innovation and working on it for the last four years. Um, so wh where do you see this venture headed kind of Tell us a little bit about where you are in your venture right now and where do you see it headed in the next five years? Sure, so right now we are um, in the testing stage and I guess to understand where we'll be in the, in the next five years, um, I'll speak a little bit to the, to the two questions we uh, were trying to solve when we were designing this product. Um, the first question was, uh, you know, the idea of menstrual pains or dysmenorrhea, um, you know, it, it, is, it is a big problem and it, it, affects, um, it affects productivity. Um, and, you know, there's that added question of accessibility. Do you have access to the therapies that alleviate menstrual pains for you? And so we started to ask ourselves a question, you know, what if the medication was the product as well? And I think that is the most exciting feature of our product is, is including a therapy within the product itself. Um, and you know, the second question we had to ask ourselves was, what does it look like to, to design for freedom? Um, a lot of these products assume a lot of their users. Um, they assume you have access to um, clean and running water. They assume you have access to hygienic facilities. Um, they also assume that you know, they, they don't really account for people with disabilities or people with mobility impairments. Um, so this is really when my public health degree um, became really useful was answering those bigger questions um, that could make this a product for as many menstruators um, globally as well. Um, and so we really started thinking about designing for that aspect to make sure this product reaches women in low resource settings, um, menstruators in post-crisis and humanitarian settings as well. Um, and, and the second question we asked ourselves was also to do with um, the stigma. Um, and so we really wanted to make a product that was aesthetic. Um, and you know, there are many ways you've done that and, and, and you'll see it shine through when, when you, you have the chance to view the product. Um, but essentially in five years time, after we have passed this initial testing stage, uh, we do hope to implement uh, this, this product. Um, but it's such a really exciting space to currently be innovating in. Innovation has been slow in, in menstrual products, um, but we really want to flip it on its head. Um, we want it to be a spoken about subject 
uh, we want menstruation to no longer be a taboo. Again, we want it to be aesthetic. We want people to be able to have these conversations. We want it to be a time that you can actually get to celebrate. Um, and we were really intentional about the features we included in this device to make sure we are we are designing for people to be able to do that. Um, the product is called Spring. The S in Spring really stands for self-expression. And we really wanted this to be a significant part of, of our entire brand. So can you give us a, a brief overview of the product? Um, maybe some of the highlights, maybe um, some of the the features that you'll be using to market. You shared a little bit about that, but can you elaborate? Um, sure. So the I'll start answering the question about the features. Um, we've we found a way to ensure that our product isn't as intimidating as other invasive devices. And so you know, that involved working with you know, people traditionally outside of this space, you know, you'll never know where you'll draw your inspiration from. And so we brought together a team of engineers and origami artists, and we were able to, you know, come up with a product that is, is small enough for beginners to, to, to insert and adopt. Um, we have, as I mentioned, included a therapy in our product for menstrual pains. Um, we've also included a way to drain our device. So we, we were really thinking about the context um, of, of a lot of our menstruators. Um, and so initially, we will begin by launching this product in the North American market. Um, they, the menstrual cups and menstrual products today have been uh, readily adopted in these markets faster. Um, and we, we want to really be respectful of people's cultural backgrounds. Um, and so when we are thinking about having a global impact, um, we'll really need to do, we will really need to be a lot more intentional about how we enter these markets. And so we're really taking um, that approach. We are starting off in North America before we, we get to the rest of the world. Great, thank, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so what is one of your, I'll, I'll loop back to this question later. Um, I really wanted you to share also a little bit about your um, reimagine award winning idea. So for everyone watching, Phyllis was recently honored as a um, one entrepreneur winner of the Reimagine Challenge uh, put together by Smith Futures. And, uh, and she was one of a very small number of people who was who were awarded from across the world. So uh, we'd love to hear about what idea you submitted there. It's quite similar in the vein of innovation and social entrepreneurship. So would you quickly share that with us as well? Sure, I'd love to. Um, I mentioned earlier that a lot of my inspiration uh, does come from Zimbabwe and, and you know the country where I grew up. I was constantly inspired by the ingenuity and you know the genius ways people were solving for you know the daily um, you know the daily issues they were running into in their lives and drawing inspiration from all sorts of things such as nature and really repurposing products in very useful ways. And I, this was an idea I, I wrote down very early on um, and I started to really develop it when, when I started attending Yale. Um, but the basis of the product, is, sorry, of, of the project um, is upcycling maker spaces. And it was really a proposal to try and close the loop in the glo global waste crisis management. Um, Currently, a lot of people in, in, low, um, in, in low developed countries um, are being hired as waste pickers. And so that's their role in, in the green economy right now. They are being hired to pick up recyclable materials um, and sell them. And you know, I, my whole proposal was just focused on reimagining the role that these people play um, and to really inspire people to think broader about where our sources of knowledge come from. Because ultimately, um, with the crisis at hand, we really need people who are able to think of the most creative ways to repurpose, not only just recycle products and use them for the same thing over and over again, but to reimagine functionalities, to reimagine how we could turn you know, basic products that we throw away into arts, into useful products. Um, 
and you know, I have a creative block as an engineer who's gone through a formal education. Um, I speak about this psychological phenomenon known as functional fixedness, which is essentially a psychological block that comes after you know, years of you know, experience in a formal education where you associate one product with one function. But you know, a lot of these people don't have that. They're pretty much immune to it. And so they can really repurpose products in unimaginable ways. You know, if I see a comb, I, I think of you know, just brushing through my hair and, and that's just about it. And you know, someone with low levels of functional fixedness will find, will just see the basic function of, of separating things. And you know, they might find a way to separate their different files and papers, for example, or you know, the, the examples I used in my um, proposal was uh, my gardener who I used to live with would you know, take an oil can, figure out you know, the kind of sounds it made. Um, he turned that into a guitar somehow. He didn't have any formal tools. He didn't use a screwdriver. He used a coin as a screwdriver. Um, and you know, just the ways, you know, this is common things we throw away all the time. And you know, he was able to, to make a guitar and, and, and gift it to me for my birthday. Uh, <laughs> didn't last very long. It eventually rusted. But just thinking of, you know, this is someone who has been unfairly um, treated and viewed as uneducated. Uh, whereas, you know, they're coming up with these genius ideas. And if we were to just draw inspiration from that, we could solve a lot of the, the challenges. You know, a lot of companies are having problems trying to find ways to recycle their current materials. And, you know, we really just need to empower this entirely, this population um, that has been put in, in, in a very different role. Um, and so that was really the focus of, of my proposal is, is to reimagine the role they play I mean, is to really bring the world together in, in solving this challenge. So when you say reimagining the role that um, the, these people are playing or can play, um, how, how do you see that? How do you see that coming into practice? Um, what kind of mechanisms are you going to be using you know, with the support of Smith Futures and, and everyone as part of the Reimagine Challenge to kind of change their roles? So I, I highlighted in my, in my proposal um, the, the use of maker spaces and just providing a safe space um, with um, access to tools, a safe working environment, um, and a ready supply of materials for these makers to utilize. Because um, currently they, they are artists who are already doing this today and are selling it to international markets. And so really it was providing them with that space as well as a platform to sell their designs internationally. Um, and so that, that was, I would say, um, what was really going to be new for these makers, but they're constantly you know, finding ways to do this already. Um, I highlighted an artist who currently um, repurposes soda cans into the most magnificent works of arts and one of his pieces actually sold for eight thousand um, dollars internationally and so if we could really bring the market to them and inspire them you know to continue um you know, utilizing this this power it really is a power that that they that they possess um and you know really uplifting them and empowering them instead of you know bringing them down because they feel they're not educated enough to have a formal and traditional way of employment. You know, they they are social entrepreneurs. They are improving their lives, and they are improving the lives of the people around them. Thanks, Phyllis. We will definitely um, be sharing this information about these maker spaces as they become alive and and accessible to those of us maybe living on opposite sides of the world. So it's so exciting to hear about the work that you're doing um, for both spring and this uh, upcycling makerspace idea. So my next question is, what is your favorite aspect of being an entrepreneur? My favorite aspect of being an entrepreneur will definitely be um, Finding where your inspiration comes from. Um, if I was to describe to people the journey of how um, this product came to be, it was really just connecting a lot of dots and, and finding inspiration in the most unlikely sources. Um, I also really love the aspect of just applying science. You know, I really came into this enjoying that aspect of my education and I really wanted to be an engineer. Um, but you know, a lot of the times as an engineer, you're really trying to just make the most technical product and something that's really cool and 
um, I could have easily made a smart tampon or pad and, you know, that you know, to solve dysmenorrhea, we could easily turn it into a heating pad as well. And there were all these really exciting technical um, innovations we could have introduced, um, which ultimately wouldn't have worked. Um, and that's when I was really introduced to the bigger side of, of entrepreneurship, which is really sort of the human centered side of it. And, and I mentioned being exposed to that through my public health degree. Um, and it's really that connection you get with the people you are solving for. I um, mean, seeing how small changes and, and thinking about things differently can really make a big impact in people's lives. You know, I mentioned designing for populations that are usually not really thought of. Um, and, and I'm really grateful to have that, that global context because I understand that you know, certain products just won't work for certain populations. No matter how effective your product is, you, know, you can have so many patents and um, clinical trials and people can really prove that it works. But ultimately, um, if your population doesn't have access to um, you know, running water, electricity, really it can make or break the kind of impact that you're having. And so for me, it was really taking this journey um, with the people I was designing for um, and, and just seeing the ways that small changes and, and the ways that listening could, could really ultimately help me design a better product for them. Thanks, Phyllis. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how uh, or, or what role Innovate Health Yale and the different Yale Entrepreneurship Centers have played in your journey? Definitely. Um, and, and this is something I was really grateful for in my Yale experience. I think Yale definitely emphasizes bringing what you learn in the classroom and, and just applying it to a real world context. I had no entrepreneurial experience coming to Yale. Um, it sounds like I do now, but really it was through the programming through, you know, Sci City at Yale, Innovate Health Yale. Um, that really took me from, you know, it's, it's really intimidating entering this space. You know, you surrounded by people who have been running companies for for years now and they're really experienced. Some of them are MBAs, but Sci City really, you know, sets out this, this welcoming environment um, where beginners are welcome and you're really exploring innovative thinking and, you know, finding where exactly your place is and where your passion is. And it's really fortunate to be assigned, you know, a couple of mentors. I think my mentors have really helped me get to where I am. Uh, funding opportunities, opportunities to pitch, which was really getting outside of my comfort zone. Um, but it was those innovative thinking skills that I really through the entrepreneurial resource scale um, that I could apply to all these exciting ideas that, that I started to, to, to formulate. Um, I, I really like the, the quote by Richard Riley that, that speaks about how students are being trained to solve problems that don't yet exist. Um, and um, I bring that quote up because my submission for the Reimagine Challenge was something I actually wrote down in a notebook, I think when I was 16 or 17 years old. And at that stage, I was not yet ready to, I didn't know how to develop a proposal, how to do a business model, how to think about feasibility, channels, you know, all the really important questions. Um, and in August, 2020, I decided to open my book again when the challenge came out to see, you know, which, which solution that I have thought about before will really apply to this challenge. And I was really confident in the training that I had received. And I feel like I was able to apply that to, to anything I'd written down in my notebook. And so I'm really grateful for the entrepreneurial resources at Yale um, that have made it a very safe space for learning, for applying what you learn in, to the, in the classroom and applying it to a global context, really just making us effective problem solvers. Thanks for sharing, Phyllis. Uh, and I'm sure you've already inspired so many people who are hopefully going to follow in your footsteps. So very exciting to hear from you. Uh, so what are one or two pieces of advice you would give to future entrepreneurs? The first piece of advice I would give is that idea um, that's you know constantly in your mind that keeps popping up when you're in the shower or you're going on a jog. Um, that you kind of brush aside because you think, oh no, that's too easy. If, if this was the solution, someone would have thought of it already. I would say definitely hold on to that. And, you know, in my case, just write it down um, because as, as, as long as you write it down, you know, it, it's there and, you know, you can go through and, and experience many years of your life. And, you know, there'll be different 
things you'll experience that will help you answer this question that you initially wrote about. And you will never know where you'll end up taking this idea. Um, you know, I, I wrote down a lot of these ideas having experienced, you know, very, I'd say very few experiences and, and a, a lot less global travel um, and, you know, a lot less, as I, as I mentioned, you know, no education background, no experience in no tertiary education background, no experience in entrepreneurship. Um, and, you know, as I went through, it's been about six years with this idea in my mind and just seeing where it started to where it is now. I'm just really happy. I just kept letting that thought and that, that idea bother me. Um, and, and you, the second thing I would say is you will never know where your inspiration will come from. So as an entrepreneur, continue learning. Um, and especially learning outside of your industry as well, I think is really important. Um, a lot of your innovations will come from connecting those dots and finding links between completely unrelated things. Um, <laughs> sometimes I always like to joke that if I was to say out loud what was really inspiring a lot of the engineering design in this product, people would be quite hesitant to put it inside their bodies, but you know, inspiration from nature, you know, the world around us, I personally think nature is the best engineer. Um, you'll just never know where that inspiration comes from. So keep reading, keep learning, be a student for life. Um, and you'll, you'll be surprised by, by where your ideas will take you. Thanks, Phyllis. So I'm going to some of the questions that we've had coming in from uh, Facebook Live. So here's a, an interesting comment, and I'd love to hear kind of your take on it, Phyllis. Uh, let's get architects and planners to innovate restrooms to make using reusable menstrual products more practical, privacy and sinks are necessary. What are your thoughts on that? So that, that, that is a very great question. And I'm really, I'm really happy this question was asked because um, a, lot, a lot of restrooms, um, especially, um, you know, in North America does a really great job of, of thinking about accessibility and, and accessible bathrooms. Um, and, and we've really thought about those things, you know, in a global context and, and how we could, you know, at this stage, make sure that, you know, our product doesn't really give our users that kind of difficulty and, and give them discomfort when they're going to a restroom and they have to empty out their menstrual cup. Um, or, you know, sometimes, you know, you'll have to, you know, dispose of particular products and, and usually those facilities aren't available. But I was really fortunate in one of the incubator programs I was a part of, one of my friends brought up a really, really important point to me. And that was, you know, thinking about menstruation um, in, in in, the ter in terms of inclusivity. Um, and my friend is transgender male. Um, and they were basically explaining to me that, you know, currently a lot of menstrual products have been advertised as, you know, feminine hygiene products. And, you know, th there is a population that has been completely silenced that experienced menstruation as well. And, you know, for them having to use um, a, a, a male bathroom, for example, with, you know, their menstrual cup baggy or, um, you know, having to throw in menstrual products, it can be a really uncomfortable experience. So even thinking about ways of, you know, respecting, you know, people's backgrounds and where they're coming from, that can really ultimately change the design of the product itself, whether you make it a discrete product. So spring fits in the palm of your hand for that reason. Um, you know, you can easily just clasp it and, and no one needs to know, although, you know, eventually, as I mentioned, we are aligning ourselves with ending menstrual stigmas and menstrual taboos. And so our case actually doubles as an accessory. It's very aesthetic. And so you can be as loud and proud as you want um, about your um, about your 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 menstrual experience. One one of our designers actually turned the case into earrings, for example. And I thought it was crazy, but I'm like, yes, this is where we're heading. Um, but you know, it's 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 really about knowing you know, your, the users you are designing for, thinking about your customer and ways you could make this product, make them feel heard, um, make them feel like you are designing for them and you did take their context into consideration. Thanks, Phyllis. So another question from Facebook Live, uh, do you have a patent or have you applied for it? Yes, <laughs> yes, we, we have applied for, for a patent. Thanks for sharing. Um, 
so I, I'd love to know what is kind of the most interesting uh, user design experience you've seen when kind of iterating these different ideas for Spring? Like what's the most unique or interesting that your designers or the, the artists you've been collaborating with have thought of? I would definitely say a lot of a lot of the really interesting ideas um, really come from, from things that aren't, aren't like related to um, to the to the product itself. Um, and just to give an example for, and and I mentioned this, I think it was page eighteen or something of my reimagine challenge proposal. Um, I speak about ways that um, the makers I was highlighting for for the maker spaces I was suggesting how they could work in collaboration with. You know, engineers who have received this this formal education and think about things from a more sort of scientific background. Um, and so we take the case of a plastic bottle um, and you slice a plastic bottle in half and you kind of have that funnel shaped part. Um, so a maker with low levels of, of functional fixedness, you know, would, would just think about the shape, you know, what they can do with the shape, how they could use that to, you know, solve the challenge that they're facing. And I came across a, a Kenyan, a South African based architect who had taken these bottles, cut them in half and had stuck them on the walls of a nursery school he was building. And essentially this is how the school children would hang their bags. Um, they would just hang them over <laughs> these, these bottles that were cut in half. And you know, that, that is ultimately you know, solving, finding a solution for that. You know, they didn't have a lot of space in, in this nursery school. And so they decided we need to find a way to hang them on the wall. And, you know, if you cut the bottom in half, you could, you could definitely achieve that just based on, on, on the shape of that design. Um, and then I looked into, I then early in my life, I remember coming across um, the exact same product, a bottle cut in half, um, except this time it was looked at from a more scientific point of view. Um, if anyone has heard of the eco cooler, <laughs> this is the innovation I'm referring to. Um, and essentially it's it used, you know, scientific concepts of just airflow um, to come up with an innovative way of cooling low resource settings where people did not have access to, to electricity. And it was the same device stuck onto the wall. Um, and essentially what would happen is when air would flow from the wider side of the bottle, um, when it entered into the narrow part, it would significantly cool the air. And so if you put a lot, a, a big number of these bottles against the wall, you could essentially cool an entire room just based on this innovation. And now you combine those two uh, products together. Not only do you have a solution to, to a storage problem, you're also solving the issue of, you know, air conditioning and now you can cool your room. And so it was really just bringing together these different minds, the exact same idea, but by embracing all forms of knowledge, you know, by, by respecting that knowledge doesn't only come from, you know, academic institutions and, you know, people are just thinking of brilliant ways of just repurposing materials. And, you know, if we are to collaborate and come together, we can solve several problems with just one product. And that was a really inspiring moment for me. And that, that was really what fueled my drive to, in particular, enter the Reimagine Challenge. Thanks so much. That That's such a fascinating example. And I love this idea of uh, cross collaboration and knowledge equity and bringing different types of knowledge into one setting, into one product. It's, it's really fascinating. Uh, so Phyllis, if somebody wanted to learn more about uh, either Spring or your makerspace ideas, uh, where, could, where could they find more information? Great, so I, I regularly post updates <laughs> on my social media. Um, and so definitely feel free to reach out to me there, all my platforms, my first and my last name, Phyllis Mugaza. But if you would love to collaborate with me on any of these pro projects, please feel free to email me um, on phyllis.mugaza at yale.edu. Um, and as soon as we launch, all the, um, all the material will be out there. But definitely be on the lookout. I know Startup Yale is coming up. You'll you'll definitely get to see a lot more of 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 the product featured there. We we are planning to apply um, to to Startup Yale, um, and so hopefully that, that you'll be able to see a, a pitch and learn more about about the product itself. Um, 
but it is something I'm, I'm actively, you know, speaking about. Um, but I love hearing people's opinions on this and, you know, ways to help and just ways of, of collaborating with entrepreneurs. So I'm, I'm always happy to connect. Thank you so much, Phyllis. And I'm so glad you mentioned Startup Yale. So if you're watching us today and you want to see uh, potentially Phyllis's idea and other amazing ideas from uh, students that are innovators and social entrepreneurs just like Phyllis, I definitely tune in to Startup Yale. It will be happening April 30th through May 1st of this year, uh, all virtual, all online. So we hope to see so many of you there. Uh, StartupYale.com is the website. And if you're a current Yale student who is uh, interested in participating in Startup Yale, please go to that website and you'll see contact info for everyone uh, and please reach out to us. Um, so I want to say thank you so much to Phyllis for sharing uh, some of your time and your wonderful energy with us today. And if you have any last things you'd like to say, please go ahead. Really, it's uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Fatima, for this opportunity. Um, thank you to Innovate Health Yale, to Sci City at Yale, all the entrepreneurial um, resources on our campus that have really built me as, as an entrepreneur um, and the, to the School of Public Health for making me a more effective engineer. Um, and really, I just would love to encourage people to, 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 not, let, to not let that idea go. You know, problem solving comes from trying to solve all the inconveniences we experience in our daily lives. And if, if you're going through that, there's probably several people who, who are experiencing it as well. And so let's all work together to just make this world a better place and, and let's collaborate. If anything, I think collaboration is, is the biggest thing, collaborating across borders as well. And you know, continuing to draw from non-conventional um, sources and, of, of inspiration. Um, thank you so much for watching. It was so lovely to have this conversation today. And I'm looking forward to connecting with you in the future. Thank you, everyone.